a mystery caterpillar and it turns into an amazing moth. Usually I show the moth briefly in the beginning of my video just to tease you. But this time I'm not going to. Want to find out the amazing moth that it will become? Then watch my moth video. Do you care to see how I raised it? Let's go back in time when all of this started. This story begins with a bunch of baby caterpillars. An entomologist that recently studied moths in Peru had provided me with the eggs of these animals that he came to study and so I gladly accepted his opportunity. Finding out what these caterpillars can eat was a bit of a shot in the dark, but fortunately it turns out that they are super polyphagous and really love to eat dandelion, sweet gum, clover, bramble and many more plants. The caterpillars were super open-minded and hungry. And before you know it, little by little, the caterpillars started to grow up. I did notice that the plant that they were really fond of, at least in captivity, was liquid umber or sweet gum, although it's unlikely that they eat this in the wild. In captivity they loved it, so I decided to exclusively use it to raise my caterpillars. Over time, as you can see, the caterpillars became hairier and hairier the bigger that they got. Exciting, no? That's interesting. Mine also got hairier the bigger it got. Uh, oh wait, that's not family friendly. <coughs> <coughs> I raised this species in an empty food container that used to contain cherry tomatoes. This seemed to work pretty well. Since this species is from a rainforest in Peru, I figured they need a high degree of humidity. As you can see, the container was full of condensation and humidity and the caterpillars didn't mind it at all. In fact, they probably liked it. In captivity, tiger moths tend to be slow-growing creatures in general, but in this case the opposite was true. In a few weeks time, their size had increased tremendously. They also grew shiny tubercules on their body, like gemstones. If you follow, follow my channel closely, you could have figured out that I'm a huge fan of tiger moths. It's one of the most diverse groups of moths, when it comes to the Mako Lepidoptera at least. And they used to be their own family, the Arctidae, with over 11,000 species. Until they got reduced to a subfamily under the Erebidae family. And now they are a subfamily Arctinae under the Erebidae. Tiger moths usually don't get as large as some of the gigantic silk moths that I typically show off on my channel. But their amazing bright colors can make up for this fact, since tiger moths are among the most colorful moths that I know of. It's also difficult to find good species to read in captivity, since not many people read them uh, as much as other families of moths. So finding a species like the Bertolia from Peru in captivity is a rare opportunity for me. About five weeks later, after receiving them as babies, it seems the caterpillars were about to be fully grown. Their appetite was declining. And then, my suspicion was confirmed in the form of a cocoon. This species spins a loose cocoon covered with hairs and pupated into a wine-red pupa. I placed my pupa in my special pupa box for tiger moths and other smaller species. Now the rest of the caterpillars were still happily eating. They don't grow. Uh, as fast equally. However, days and days later more pupa started forming. And then the waiting game began. Thankfully this species doesn't stay in inside your pupa for long it seems. A relatively short time later, about two weeks, the moths were close to emerging. And there it is! Our first Bertolia moth. We have to wait for it to dry its wings. That's the main reason it's folding them behind its back like this. This is the first time I've ever seen a Bertolia in real life. The genus Bertolia is super interesting and contains over 20 species last time I checked. I'd love to have a closer look at all of them if I could. And soon it lowered its wings when they were finally dry. 
Oh my god, look at those amazing colors. Want to know an amazing fact? These moths are able to avoid bats by emitting ultrasonic clicks that interfere with the echolocation of bats. They are more or less able to jam the sonar of bats, rendering them blind in close distances. Tiger moths are common prey for bats, which use sonar or echolocation vibrations to locate them. The bats, the bats rely on sonar echoes, bouncing off a prey's body to determine its position. In addition to flight, tiger moths have developed another mechanism to avoid being eaten, sonar jamming. When a moth detects a sonar signal, it releases a series of ultrasonic clicks that mix with the echoing signals the bat uh, requires to locate it. Moths are able to effectively distinguish between false and actually predatory threats based on the pulse interval and intensity of the bat's sonar. When attacked by a bat, Bartholdia responds with a barrage of clicks up to 4000 per second that cause, cause the bat to alter its echolocation behavior and narrowly miss the prey. So to sum it up, these moths actually have the hidden ability to disturb the echolocation of a bat. Basically they have sonar jamming technology. Isn't that super interesting? This was my short but also educational video about a Bertoldia moth. I hope you enjoyed seeing them grow up from caterpillars into moths. Don't forget to subscribe, like the video and consider donating since my channel has been completely demonetized by YouTube. I film the life cycles of moths which is very time consuming and expensive content to make. Of course, I appreciate all my viewers. Peace out and I hope to see you again in my next upload. Bye bye!